Hello, everybody. We're, uh, I'm Marcia Crosas from the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University. Uh, we're here to talk about cloud dataverse with the joint uh, talk with my collaborators Oren and PNI from the Massachusetts Open Cloud. Uh, and we, what we want to tell you in this talk, if we just uh, have to send one message, is that data repositories need clouds, and clouds need data repositories. Um, and that's why we build Cloud Data First. Uh, but we'll go into the details about that. First, where, where was the need? Why um, uh, it, we are at a point that data repositories need the cloud and the cloud needs the data? Uh, then also we'll, we'll introduce our platforms, the Dataverse as the, an open source uh, platform for uh, building data repositories, and the Massachusetts Open Cloud built on top of OpenStack. And, and then we'll show you the solution when we bring um, MOC, the Massachusetts Open Cloud, and Dataverse together. So first, uh, we, we're not the only ones that have seen the value in data. AWS already for, uh, for the last few years have uh, realized that data is, imp uh, is important and it needs to be close to computing. Uh, they say in, the, in their AWS public data sets, uh, initiative, they say, when data is made publicly available on AWS, anyone can analyze any volume of data without needing to download or store it in themselves. So they bring data from different fields. Uh, one of the known data sets that are in AWS is the 1000 Genome Project. This allows, uh, by having the data close to computing, allows to analyze those data sets from the volunteer 1000 genomes. And, and from there, you can find variants in mutations of different populations within a population or across populations. So it's a new discovery for science. But, but that also applies for data from many other fields and for an industry, right? And you could get, and just having this access to data and close to the computing allows you to discover new insights. But AWS, however, doesn't, doesn't get, well, doesn't provide all the features that you would need for a public, for a data repository in, in today's world. What, one of the things that you need first is to have all the, the incentives to, for data sharing so that those uh, the data authors, if, if you are one of them, for example, that have created, have collected data, prepared the, the data set so that it can be uh, analyzed and have worked on cleaning it and processing, you have spent a lot of time working on that data set. And you might be okay making that available for others so that you're not the only one discovering insights from that data. But on the other hand, you wanna get credit for that. And uh, we've, uh, we found that uh, with formal data citations, having a way to, to provide a reference to that data set that gives you attribution for the data set is one way of, of building an incentive for uh, sharing your data. Uh, the, the, these type of citations or references to data sets need to be done in a way that you can cite every version of the data set. Uh, the data set in a way is a living object. It might be, in, it's not just a publication. Uh, um, like a book or paper, but it, it just it will continue having new versions, and you want to be able to reference the version that you had used for your um, discovery. Uh, those data sets also need to provide enough metadata so that they can be discovered easily through uh, discovery indices or other systems that go and search for data sets. And, and very importantly, the data repository needs to support features that will allow to have tier access to the data. So uh, in cases not, not like, um, well, AWS public data sets, that, are, that all the data sets are, pu are completely public and open, but in cases that you need to have a certain license or data use agreement or some other restrictions to access the data, you can provide that through your repository. And then finally, that repository needs to have a commitment uh, to archive that data. So if you have refer you're referencing your data from some other source, you can guarantee that that data set will still be accessible over time. So the, it turns out that the scientific community have been working with data repositories for a long time. Uh, they, uh, across different 
uh, research fields and across uh, different well continents. Uh, they've been building uh, archi data archives and repositories that provide this access to data. Uh, it started in, from the late 1950s and all the way to, to our current times. And it goes again, as you see, across social science, life sciences, earth sciences, and astronomy. But today's data repositories uh, provide uh, additional features to those, uh, well, to those uh, uh, data archives that uh, were from last century. So they also have figured out, as I said before, that the incentives to, for data sharing are, are important. They provide a, um, a platform that would allow you uh, as a data generator, data author, to upload the data and make it available to others, but you, you continue with the, having control over that data set. Uh, this started with our project, the Dataverse project in 2006, to pro with a system that provides a, 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 the software for building this type of data repositories, of uh, modern day data repositories. There are other examples like uh, the Dryad data repository, Fixshare, Zenodo, and others. And, and if you see in the RW3, um, R3 data um, website for all the, for, uh, is that, what happened here with, uh, okay, well, Okay, it's back. Uh, is it okay? Can I continue? Okay. So, something is happening. So, the, um, well, we saw in the previous slide, I'm afraid to move it because, <laughs> back to that slide. But in the previous slide, we saw that, that uh, from in the last decade, the number of data repositories have increasing uh, enormously. Um, and, and uh, again, with the, um, the point about make, building those incentives and building data citations, what that means is that when you have a bibliography, a reference, oh, this continues moving, is that, a, <laughs> okay, uh, let me go back. So when, when you have a bibliography, you would have not only references to other publications, but also references to data sets with, uh, with the data repository that that data set can be found and with attribution to the data authors. So the Dataverse open source platform has helped over this last decade um, to, for others to build, other different organizations to build uh, data repositories of many types. Some of these data repositories would support um, multiple universities, like for example, the one in the, in, uh, hosted in a University of Texas, but it, it supports 20 different universities uh, in that area. Uh, there are some that have to be, that are set up in China because the, that way uh, the, the repository has more control of the data and they can, they, for legal reasons, they need to have the data, the data in, locally in China. Um, this, it's moving um, by itself. So sorry that I keep going back, but I'll try. Uh, and there are the data repositories that are uh, uh, specific to a domain, like for example, an agri agriculture data repository, the ICRISAT. But what are the challenges with a platform like the Dataverse uh, software uh, or other rep current repositories? So that they, they only support small data sets. Uh, you, you cannot copy easily uh, petabytes of data uh, to those repositories and deposit it in them. And also, they, not, ev not everybody, when you need to download the data or do you need to access it for computing, not everybody has all the, uh, the tools that would enable computing of those data sets. So it misses the computing and the support for large data sets. So we came to the conclusion that Dataverse needed a cloud. And I'll pass that to Oren now. So, so I want to tell you a little bit about the Masters Open Cloud, which is this sort of regional project that was going on sort of before this connection. 
So this is a cloud. It um, it's, uh, involves uh, five of the largest universities in the world, actually, Boston University, uh, the whole UMass system, Northeastern, MIT, Harvard. Um, and, um, and just to give you a feeling for what that means, this is the whole Pacific coast of the US. This is the Pacific research platform. It's all these institutions that cover that entire area. And if you take that, and you kind of compare that consortium to the MGH-PCC consortium, which is, um, which is what the MOC is based on, is they're actually equivalent, right? They're about the same number of students. They both have these massive communities of scientists covering every field of research, collaborations across the globe, massive amounts of data and computational requirements. Um, and, you know, we're talking about 175,000 students. But there's one little difference between the MGHPCC consortium and the Pacific Research Platform is imagine taking that whole thing and smooshing it into one building. That's what we've done here in Massachusetts. Um, the MGHPCC data center, we built a shared data center, 15 megawatts, 90,000 square feet. You're talking about two acres of space. It already has tens of thousands of HPC and we have still tons of space to grow in this. So, we have all that infrastructure smooshed into one building, right? And that gives us an incredible opportunity to build the cloud, which is what we've been doing with the MOC. Um, it actually involves those five institutions, uh, the Air Force, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, five major corporates. In fact, Chris Wright in his keynote just uh, a little while ago uh, was discussing sort of the, the shared relationship between Red Hat and this, and a lot of other contributing partners. So, a fundamental difference between what we're doing is today's clouds are basically a black box. They're stood up by one provider that controls the whole thing. Um, you can't see inside it. We wanted to create a more open model of cloud, what we call an open cloud exchange, where different institutions or different companies can stand up infrastructure, charging in different models for that infrastructure. Different groups can actually stand up production cloud environments on top of this. Um, and we could also have research environments on top of this. So this enables research all the way down into the sort of fundamental platform capabilities. And many different environments stood up on top of this to solve problems in big data or web or HPC. And in fact, where we were funded from the Commonwealth was to help enable the big data ecosystem of the Commonwealth. So we started off with OpenStack, which is great, but where's the data? You know, we needed a fundamental capability, we needed to be able to share data with this new open cloud exchange model between different providers of infrastructure. We also needed to expose all that cloud metadata up to researchers that might want to analyze it or to users. That source of information seemed to be dramatically important. You can't see operational information about any existing cloud today. Our scientific users needed many of the same things that Merce was talking about. You know, they wanted to not be able to deal with petabytes of data, or at least many terabytes of data, and downloading that over the internet was kind of horrific to them. We wanted to have the public data sets, like Amazon has, but we also wanted to have community data sets, data sets shared with astronomy or within a group in biology. Um, they, we wanted to, scientists actually spend enormous efforts creating those data sets. They didn't just want to make them public, they wanted to actually control who could access those data sets and know that they were getting citations for all the work that they'd done creating those data sets. And they wanted to have, be able to exploit the rich tools, you know, be able to stand up rapidly a Hadoop environment um, or an, a different kind of analytics environment on top to compute in that data set. We also had this rich set of industry and public sector co um, companies that were actually, and companies and public sector institutes involved in it, that wanted to put their data sets up there. To share their data with all kinds of researchers and startups, again, part of the mission was to actually enable startups in the Commonwealth. Um, but we actually hit some really interesting things. They did not want to put their public data sets just, or make them public data sets. For example, we're working with the MBTA. They have this massive data set for where every bus has been for every second for the last 10 years, right? So cool information could do all kinds of interesting stuff on top of that, but it also has inside it the name of the bus driver, right? So, you know, can you imagine these public institutions, they would be love to have all kinds of people doing analytics on top of it, but they're not going to go through the work of anonymizing these data sets. They want to sort of put it out there, allow it to be discoverable by people, 
and then make, up, make an agreement to actually make that data set available to them. So they want to be very open, but if you're going to add this barrier that it has to be public, then you're never going to get it out there in the cloud. Um, and a model where all these data sets exist so we could have all kinds of um, companies expose their value in an environment where all these data sets exist. So we really realized fairly rapidly, and we're excited when Merce met with us and we started talking about the synergy between these, that the MOC needed a modern data set repository system. But more fundamentally, we think this is a fundamental requirement for OpenStack. There's nothing so esoteric. I mean, we have an immediate demand for it, but there's nothing so esoteric. You know, we think that um, data is going to drive compute in the future, and there's nothing like that in OpenStack today. So now p is going to talk about the work we did to integrate this together. Good morning, <clears throat> and welcome to Boston. For some of you out of town, I hope you are having a good time. I always do at OpenStack Summit. So uh, let's see what we have. Merce mentioned about Dataverse, what it's all about. Public data set, incentive to the other, great. We built MOC, Massachusetts Open Cloud. We have a couple of clouds in our data center at MTHPCC. So this is Dataverse before Cloud Dataverse. What do we have? We have obstacle here. We have the internet. You put the repository in one place, not co-locate in the, your compute platform. In this case, is OpenStack. You got the internet bandwidth that you have to deal with. That's not fun. We know that. This is Dataverse after Cloud Dataverse, and specifically with OpenStack. What, what OpenStack brings to the, data, the repository like Dataverse is compute, you have Nova, you have Swift object storage, and oh, you also have UI. You need a way for users to get access to it. Awesome. So what's the problem here? What's missing from the OpenStack cloud? We need a bridge between the repository and the compute platform. So we built what we call Gigi. It's a simple UI, very simple. And by the way, there's a talk about Gigi later on, if anyone interested in it. So Gigi is a bridge between OpenStack. It talks to different services in OpenStack. And then it also serves as a gateway into repository like Dataverse. Now, what missing in Dataverse? Somehow you need to allow the user to get to the Swift endpoint there. So what we do is that we, in the Dataverse, we make change to the code so that instead of uploading to the file system, you uploading to the Swift object directly. And then we create a push button, compute button in Dataverse. Those are very simple changes in Dataverse, and voila, we got the Dataverse. So in summarize again, summary again, we put Swift, which make chain, make sure that Dataverse can upload to Swift. We have that compute button Dataverse, and now we got Dataverse. Next, we would like to demonstrate, we have a very neat, I thought so anyway, a, a demo that demonstrates it's, it's about billion object platform at the, at the Harvard business, at the IQSS uh, at Harvard also. And um, I will let the demo speak for itself, but it will demonstrate how you can take the tweets and then put it in the in database, upload it to, to the Swift. We walk through from the Swift endpoint to Gigi you can be back and forth between Gigi and Horizon, and then bring up Sahara to build. And finally, you get to the Spark cluster from the Gigi, and you get the report. Okay. That worked before, so we know it works. Just mm -hmm. no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's uh, move. Maybe move that in here. Yeah. 
and then left, and I have to think, here we go. That's it. We have the idea for this. <coughs> it's playing now. Uh, we start again there. <laughs> okay, let, let, let's see if we can start this from the beginning. Um, so this demo here, we're starting off with the Bob platform, it's GeoTweet. Um, in the you see on the screen there that you can specify the time, date and time frame that you want to take the tweet from. And then this is like space, spatial, um, geospatial, and it that long. So let's say that we want to look for the word code from, the, from Bob and ask it to search for the keyword. Come up with about a million million tweets there. And you all can zoom in using Bob. You can zoom in a certain area. Once you zoom in a certain area, you will see the number here change to the number of tweets actually happen there. And then from there, you click. And then each time you click on each of the tweets, you can see that it does go to where the, it got mentioned itself. So in the in the bob here, there is a button, okay, that he just clicked the DataWorks button, and then we'll come to, this is the DataWorks, Cloud DataWorks, and then you log in, you have to log in in order to get access to the data. Come here, you will see that you have the Bob Geo Tweet code data set there, you click on that. And then you'll notice that we now have the container because you click the data was the data got the data set got uploaded to Swift endpoint with the container name. And you see that when you the container name you, you have the container name there so you can do anything you want from then on. And there's another way that you, you also that you see a compute button there. That's the out gateway into OpenStack. You click on the data, data file itself. There's also another button there which is compute button. So this is a document URL, right? I mean, once you're in the Swift, you can take this data and do any compute you want. You don't need OpenStack actually if you just want a simple like what it's demonstrate here. You can get to that data, data set itself. Now, if we click on the compute button, now we get into OpenStack. What we show here is Gigi. This is a simple UI I mentioned about. So you come in here, you basically talk to Sahara. We build a cluster, a launcher cluster. We can do a small Spark cluster, give it a cluster name. Now, Anyone that knows Sahara would know that there are many, many forms you have to fill out before you get to this point. What we have done 
it just have some couple defaults for user. And you have, you see if you launch a cluster, you see that it's, it's, pen, it's pending the job. And then now I think he's gonna go to do the job, run the job there, create a job that you like to do, a simple word count on Spark. And then the input, you put and put the star there, just capture anything that's there, and then specify the output. Click on launch. Now you have your cluster, you have your Sahara cluster, Spark cluster, and now you run your job. You click on, there's a button on the GG side that you just click, and that go, this is horizon. You will see that the job is run there, and you can go to your Spark cluster here, and you see that the job is running there. All this is the actual time. We didn't cut out any time at all, so right now the job is running. This is going to take a few minutes, about 13 seconds here, that we'll wait. So we want to make sure we get the effect of the real job that's running, and um, you see, go to, to see the container that the job is it's running, and you should see the result. It says successful. And this is the part. Okay, um, so that's the demo that we have. You see the journey from when we upload the, um, let's say, let, let me summarize it. We starting with the scientists want to Lucy want to upload her data and build on it. She started doing that by go to Bob platform. She, she tried to see what in the tweets that she interested in. And then she clicked the button, the, the brow button there to go to Dataverse. And once she done that, the data get uploaded to Swift and then Bob will bring her to Dataverse, and you see the green button there, that's a compute button that we've gone through from, from the demo there. Once she click that, she can get into Gigi. In the meantime, on the Swift there, you can do any compute, R or whatever you like to do. Once you get to Gigi though, you can go back and forth, and then you can go to Sahara, bring up your Spark cluster, and then Spark will produce a report to you. At any time at all between Gigi and, and Horizon, you can go, go to Horizon from Gigi. So how long it took us to do all this? We started off back last year in the summer, we started off doing some POC just to try out, to see you know, it would work at all. And then it, sure enough, I mean, it, it works fine. And very simple, this is a very simple concept here. It's nothing complicated, but it works. And then back in the fall, we went to Dataverse community. Don't forget that Dataverse is just another open source project. So we, got, we went there and asked if this would be useful to them, and they say yes. We also showcasting this at the Barcelona doing the VBrow back. Got very good comments out of that. And then back in December, we have our MOC annual workshop where we demonstrate this to our user, cloud user, and they say, this is a great feature, we would like to see it. So, we start all this in January. This January, with full collaboration between the two teams. And now, at the summit, we have the full Swift feature in Dataverse, that is up on Dataverse repository, um, GitHub. It's got merged, I think like last week, last Thursday. We also have Gigi that MOC built, and then we bring up you the demo. And now, in the summer, what we would love to do is to do Worldwide Data Federation, which Mose is gonna talk next. I want to skip this view. Okay. We just so you know, there are a few uh, other talks related to this one with demos. You can find information in the schedule. 
So, yeah, if, uh, hopefully we've convinced you that the uh, value of linking a data repository platform into an OpenStack cloud, and that way making it easy to bring data into the cloud and in a more reliable way and more, uh, um, with more features that will support the, the data sets. But uh, it, it can get even better. There is no, our goal is not only to bring, to have a solution for one cloud uh, to have a, a repository in that cloud, but also have the, the network of Dataverse repositories around the world connected in a way that they can all upload easily the, those data to one cloud Dataverse. And that, that way you have a federation, a worldwide federation of data sets that can be computed in the cloud. And each repository can enable that in a way that makes it very easy to make a data public, or either public or with, um, with restrictions, but in a, in a place with, close to computation. And that's the, one of the next uh, projects as part of this Cloud Dataverse. So to, to end this talk, we started with the data repositories need clouds. Clouds need data repositories. And we, we showed you that with Cloud Dataverse, we combine the power and scalability of OpenStack Cloud with the need to access data using a feature-rich uh, repository. And we haven't done that alone. We've done that with a team of uh, a Dataverse team of um, developers and, uh, and the MOC team also, developers and others. So we thank our teams and thank you for listening. So hopefully we have time for a few questions. If people need to get to lunch, we understand, but. Any questions? Yeah, go. Yeah, if you can go up to the mic, that'd be great, so it's recorded. Hello, okay, seems louder. Uh, so it seems like that Gigi uh, has to, I mean, this data was needs to work with Gigi to talk to Horizon and uh, Sahara. So why isn't this Gigi be part of the data was? Um, I, I, I think, first of all, it's not necessary. You can take the URI. It's in Spark. You know, it's all, you can take the URI and copy it manually into the other so, stuff. But, so, but really what we want to do is, the, just like OpenStack, there's a series of different projects, right? And um, Gigi, you'll see a whole talk on that this afternoon, but it's actually not intended to supplement Horizon. People are going to want to do complex things in Horizon at some point in time. GG is, though, meant for our users to be able to have a fast experience to do the most common thing. Yeah, to add on to that, data was, it's not a computer platform. Data was, it's a data repository, right? So, and beside OpenStack, I believe there's a future coming up that's going to be, you know, integrate with other cloud, for example, Azure from Windows or even AWS, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to mix between the two feature, big rich feature that there, and that's why we build a separate thing out of it. I see, yeah. okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, so what we'd really love to do is we'd love to get this as a, essentially another project in OpenStack, although like other things like Keystone is broader than that. So please, we'd love people to participate, yeah, can, join in on, on this effort. Yes, and come think, to talk to us about ideas, suggestions of how to make that project, uh, how to integrate it with other pieces of OpenStack uh, if needed, and we'll be happy to, or to come and contribute to the team, to the, our project together. So. And we think this is a fundamentally missing part. Like when we serve, when we saw this from the MOC side, we felt like, a Dataverse-like thing was a fundamentally missing part of a cloud platform. So I'm kind of shocked that nobody's been doing this till now. There was a question back there? Just a quick question. How is, how is this relating to your uh, business case for uh, a hard drive store? So are you using this in relation to that? Um, no, the, the two really aren't related. It's, it's like this is, this is about, you know, this isn't about the open cloud exchange part, although you can tie this into where you store the data. Right. So one other thing that I didn't mention, right, you talk about OpenStack services. One other th big thing, there are two pieces there. 
you have services that OpenStack Cloud bring, but you also have resources that you can provide it to the database user. And those resources include petabyte of you know, storage space, right? So the one of each in OpenStack today is the fact that if you're in one cloud, you might not have the storage there, but there's another OpenStack cloud that has a storage. We do have a project, Mix and Match Federation. The GitHub is up on OpenStack right now. And with that project, we are hoping someday to go to Big Ten. We don't know when yet. But with that project, if you are in one cloud, you can go out and get storage from another cloud with your own identity. You don't have to go and have identity in the other cloud. Not necessarily, you don't have to log into the other cloud to do that. So there's a, there's a fee brought back from last year, last sub summit, that talk about mix and match the resource federation. Matter of fact, the project list is here, Christy. If you're interested in talking to him about it. Yeah. But yeah. these aren't directly related. This is a way of storing your data and you can control where you store it eventually. Is this working? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so Dataverse is one of many um, uh, <clears throat> places where researchers can put their data. There's obviously lots of domain or discipline specific data repositories as well. EBI is one of them. I see that there's, um, this is a great opportunity, but the um, diversity of platforms to store published data is huge. Um, we have the same problem getting research data in and out of our cloud environment. Mm -hmm. um, across this diversity of different solutions that are distributed globally is a big yeah. issue um, and a big challenge. So I'm just, um, I guess, questioning and wondering what an effective, I think it's a very good problem to think about and solve, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering what we can do to uplift everyone. Um, is a focus on Dataverse appropriate? Is a framework to enable multiple um, repositories, um, entry into OpenStack more appropriate? And so mm -hmm. on, so I'm kind of just thinking about what sort of model would right, work right. No, best it's a good to question. uplift this data compute, you're saying that right. compute's going to be data driven, agree wholeheartedly, so how do we uplift everyone? Right, right, and it's a good question and a good, in some way a good problem to have because we do want to work with other repository platforms so that this could be, I mean, at the end, the same way that PNI was saying this could be a solution for other type of clouds and not only OpenStack cloud, uh, uh, it can also be a solution for other type of repositories. I do want to clarify though that there are many, a uh, very large number of data repositories and many that are domain specific, but there are much fewer platforms that are open source with a community of contributors that are building repository software. Uh, there are maybe, uh, maybe a handful of them uh, that are actually in use. Dataverse is one of the, wide, the more widely used. So we don't provide, a, uh, we have a Harvard Dataverse, for example, uh, we, uh, at Harvard for any, a, any um, contributor to deposit the data there, but we don't provide a repository solution, only one repository. We provide the platform to build any type. So MBI, I, 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 some genomics data could build their repository on top of Dataverse. So we thought that the, cho the choice of Dataverse with OpenStack gives two open source uh, solutions with a community that, uh, that has the most, um, uh, it can, can support the most variety, largest varieties or the widest range of repositories and clouds. So uh, that's so, the main reason. So as an external, per, like we, you know, PNI and I aren't part of the Dataverse stuff, so we kind of were evaluating different alternatives, and it was actually what Mercedes said. It was, first of all, that this was an open source platform, B, that it actually what could support the customization for multiple different domain-specific types of data, and, and see, um, sorry? Data citation. We, so, so there's a series of, Mercedes said, there's a few yes. of these things that did that, but, but the things that differentiated this was that it was a platform rather than something specific to one domain. And if we wanted to create a cloud that, was, that supported multiple different domains, there wasn't actually that many options around. Um, and this has a lot of traction. So it's like anything in, in OpenStack, right? You end up having a reference implementation that's, um, that is there. I think this is a very, for us, we wanted it a full solution. This is a very reasonable reference implementation, but it should support alternatives that, that yes. you know, different people can put into it. But At I think end, it's a reasonable right. reference implementation. 
Okay. Exactly, and at the end, I think that uh, that's what we think that we're being pioneers is to bringing this data sharing and data repositories close to cloud platforms. So, but this is one implementation. Peter, of it. And, do you want to go to the mic, Peter? Sorry, the recording. Peter is part of Emocity from Nordison University. Just the, um, yeah, so just adding on to that is that, you know, this is veering a bit from the OpenStack side towards the scientific researcher side, but, you know, like in computer science, there's a bunch of different ad hoc repositories of things, but, you know, what we've certainly seen in Dataverse is that this is actually, you know, it has support for citation. You know, it's it has a whole bunch of features that, you know, I mean, there's been scientific librarians involved in this whole thing. Um, you know, so it has a lot of features on the on the archival and science side of it uh, that are important, and I'm sure that there are others in fields that I, as a computer scientist, I'm not aware of, but certainly in CS there aren't. So I, I'm curious, but the other thing that really kind of resonated for us too is that our industry partners wanted to publish data sets, make them available and discoverable immediately to everybody, and then make them available so that people could come and request access to the data set rather than just making them public data sets. Um, we'd love to also hear of use cases. So, you know, after this, if people could sort of describe to us, because our feeling is, you know, this was designed for scientists, but it seems very, very general purpose to us and of value to a much broader community. So I'd love to hear of other use cases and features we need yes, to do. Yes, that would be great. And right. also, if you want to learn more about Dataverse in a, uh, in June the 14th, 15th, and 16th, there is the Dataverse community meeting here at Harvard University. You're welcome uh, to join us. And there will be, again, several related talks to this uh, this afternoon and on Wednesday, right? Yep. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you.